All right, welcome to our Sunday morning sermon. It'll be the 11th of January, 2022. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Galatians 4, that's where we'll be today. Um, a lot of things happening. It's the 11th of December. The next uh, three to four weeks are quite busy. So we have tonight um, our birthday party for Jesus, which is a... Uh, annual event we have for our Awana kids and any kids could come and there'll be games and cupcakes, taco soup. And uh, that's at five o'clock here at the church. Everyone's welcome to come and uh, uh, kind of celebrate that. And then on the 18th of December, that's a week from today will be our food distribution Sunday. And we have 35 families that we will uh, be delivering. Uh, we haven't been able to deliver the last couple of years because of COVID, but now we can deliver. So we really need help in delivering those uh, boxes, kind of putting them together, and that'll be right after church. And we'll uh, we'll do that. Even if you can just grab a couple boxes and then uh, deliver them, that would be wonderful. Um, that's a week from today, um, a week from Sunday, uh, the 18th, and the 25th is Christmas. We'll have a special uh, Christmas. Um, service obviously uh risk regular day of nine o'clock and sunday school 10 o'clock church and then uh, the following week is new year's day which will have a special day kind of uh have communion start the year off right and we'll be studying communion and uh what it means and, and uh, why it's important and so uh busy next four weeks we look forward to uh if you can join us online that's fine if you can join us in person that's even better um but that's the things that are coming up uh, over the next four weeks. We'll not have Sunday evening services, but we will be having uh, midweek Bible studies. So look for those both posted on YouTube and also uh, on Facebook and uh, live. If you can come 630 Wednesday nights, that would be great also. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Ask you to continue to bless our studies as we move into uh, Christmas and move into New Year's. Uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Lord, this message today is an important one. As Father, we look at the principles of twos uh, throughout Scripture. Help us to be encouraged by it, challenged by it, convicted by it, if we have not accepted you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and so we're going to talk a little bit today about <clears throat> excuse me, something called the principles of two. We're going to see that as we... Um, we go in the in Galatians is particularly the, the 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 way of the law and the way of grace, the way of works and the way of faith. And so we'll look at uh, some other principles. And what I mean by the principles of two is is there's choices uh, in in our walk on this earth, and the choices really come down to two choices. Either I am for God. Or I am against God. If you're not for me, you are against me. He that has the son has the life. He that has not the son has not life. Uh, and so we'll look at those as we go forward. Um, so Paul, we talked last week, is very emotional in this particular portion of his letter. Um, he grieved last week because the, the, uh, they look at verse 16 of Galatians 4. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In verse 15, he says, for I bear witness, if possible, you would have plucked your eyes out and given them to me. So it was a little bit of an emotional lesson last week in talking about how um, close Paul was to the Galatians. And yet they turned away from his the, the message of grace and, and accepted this message of works. And it frankly breaks his heart. And now they kind of turned against Paul. And he says, you know, because I've told you the truth, you're turning against me. So then he says in verse 21, tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? In other words, <laughs> do, you, do you understand what you're doing? Don't you, don't you know what the law says? And if you want to come under the law, <clears throat> then you're under the law and under the law of, of the scriptures of holiness, you've got to keep every law in the law. We've gone through this is a school teacher. 
uh, that brings this a uh, truth that Romans 3.19, we are all guilty before God. So the law has done its work. It's, it's, it's proven the Galatians and every other man and woman on earth to be guilty of breaking the law. And the wages of sin is death. So they have accepted this grace of God while Paul was there, but now they're doing what many of us do. It, it, once they're saved, they kind of slip back into the law and into works. Um, but I like this, this statement where it says, you who desire to be under the law. And uh, I want to tell you that we're not any longer under the law. Uh, there's a, an interesting phrase that, that you could say that someone is above the law. And someone would say to you who breaks the law, what do you think you're above the law? And in a way, we're above the law. But the Galatians wanted to come back under the law. Uh, and they wanted to make something unconditional that was conditional. The law is conditional. Under the rules of the law, You've got to keep every law, every moment, in order for the law to save you. And you say, well, that's impossible. That's why the law doesn't work. So the law does its work by showing you it doesn't work. And under the law, we are all doomed. The wages of sin is death. And under the law, we are dead. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. The law is under a Christian. <clears throat> See, we're not under the law. The law is under us. What does he mean by that? <clears throat> it is for him to walk on, to be his guide, his rule, his pattern. Law is the road that guides us, not the rod that drives us. Interesting. Law is the road that guides us. Is the law good? Of course it is. Do we want to keep the Ten Commandments to the best of our ability? Do we want to keep the laws and the rules and the morals of God? That's our desire. What it means to be not under the law is we are no longer under the punishments. Christ is above the law. We're not really above the law because we're, we're but Christ is. He defeated the punishment of the law by taking this he who knew no sin became sin for us romans 5 8 god demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners christ died for us <clears throat> we do kind of get away with sin why because price paid the price so we're no longer under the punishment of the law it's still our guide to keep not as if the conscience is now insensitive to the law, but the law cannot drive the conscience to despair. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. If the Son shall make you free, you're free indeed. This again is Spurgeon. That, that the law brings guilt, but God brings salvation. We are condemned because we've not believed in him. We'll look at that later on, but there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So now we're above the punishments of the law, and now we follow the law because it's the right thing to do, because it makes our lives better, and because it's a service and, and honor to God. But if you want to try to get to heaven By keeping the rules and regulations of the law and by works, not by works of righteousness as we have done, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works. But if you want to try to get to heaven by works, then you are now under the law. But if you trust in Jesus Christ and you've said to Jesus, Lord, I am a sinner. I confess with my mouth that you're Lord. I believe in my heart. You're risen from the dead. Lord, save me. Now the law is under you, a guide to you. It no longer rules you, but guides you. And he says to them in verse 21, tell me those who desire to be under the law. Don't you hear what the law says? 
says you're guilty and you're doomed. And, and then he turns to an illustration. And it's an illustration that's a very interesting one. And we're going to go into pretty good detail on this because it's important. Good little Bible study coming up. And he says, verse 22, it is written that Abraham had two sons. This is, again, the principles of two today. This is where it starts. It starts with the two sons of Abraham. The one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman bondage or freedom principles of twos but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh he who was a free woman through promise which things are symbolic so paul admits i'm going to use an illustration here this is a symbolic picture of law and grace this is a symbolic picture of flesh and spirit it's a symbolic picture of salvation and being lost. Verse 24, which things are symbolic, for these are two covenants, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, the law, New Covenant, Christ, principle of twos. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with their children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is mother of us all. So now we have these two mothers, Sarah and Hagar. They're two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Two mountains, Mount Sinai and what we're going to see is Mount Zion. They are two, these two sons representing two ways, two mountains, two mothers, two sons, the principle of two. So let's look at these mountains. Hebrews 12, 18 says this. <clears throat> Again, the Hebrews have the same problem as the Galatians, wanting to reach back to the laws. And God says to them in Hebrews 12, verse 18, you've not come to the mountain that may be touched. When, when, we're talking about the other mountain other than Sinai. It's not a physical mountain. Because Mount Sinai and even the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, they both represent the law. So Paul says in Hebrews 12, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. We're not talking about that mountain. That's what Hagar represents, this, this, this Mount Sinai that was a fearful mountain that shook and, and lightning, and, and they didn't want to hear from God anymore because he came with rules that they couldn't keep. And so he came with doom because they, they were unable to follow Look at verse 22 of Hebrews 12. But you have come to Mount Zion. Well, what is Mount Zion? And the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So the, the new mountain is heaven. It's Mount Zion. It is new Jerusalem that, that we will see in the book of Revelation. Verse 23 of Hebrews 12 the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men made perfect. Who praise God. The law shows me I'm not perfect. So I turned to Jesus and said, Lord, forgive me. And he makes me perfect. Justified by grace through faith. Verse 24 of Hebrews 12, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. Now, Abel, there were these two sacrifices, the one brought by Cain, unacceptable, and the one brought by Abel, acceptable, but nothing compared to the full accepted sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the better covenant, the better sacrifice, the better mountain, the better place. The principle of twos. The law or Christ, works or grace, 
What's it going to be? And these two sons of Abraham represent these two ways. So <clears throat> what is this story um, uh, that he's talking about? Well, let's go review it. So let's go back to Genesis. And we'll look at this life of Hagar and Sarah. It all starts in Genesis chapter 16. We're going to just read the story to you, read some verses. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 16 in Genesis. Sarai, not yet Sarah, Abram's wife, not yet Abraham, had borne him no children. She was barren. That's important. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar, an Egyptian maidservant. Not even Hebrew. So Sarai said to Abraham, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Go into my maid, and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. <clears throat> Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Sarai, Abraham's, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband and Abram to be his wife after Abraham dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. <clears throat> so now there was this, this obvious sin, this obvious mistake. Sarai and Abram didn't trust that God, they were 80, Abram's 86 here. And he doesn't trust that God is going to be able to keep his promise. So they work of the flesh and they devise their own way of doing things, their own way to get God's work done. Didn't trust him. And she becomes pregnant and immediately they begin to despise each other. Look at verse six of chapter 16. Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Obviously, it's not going to work. The jealousy, the, either from the pregnancy and, and Hagar jealous of uh, Sarah, the, the mistress, and, and all of these things, just never going to work. Uh, and so she casts her out. Verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord found her, that's Hagar, by the spring of water in the wilderness. In the spring on the way to Shur, and she said to Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit yourself to her. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I'll multiply your descendants exceedingly, so they shall not be counted for the multitude. And the angel said to her, behold, you are with child. You'll bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. And the word name Ishmael means God hears. He shall be a wild man, verse 12. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Verse 15 says, so Hagar bore Abraham a son. Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar was born Ishmael to Abram. And Ishmael now is going to be a father of many nations because he's going to be the basic patriarch of all the Arab nations, this Egyptian. Um, and so this story starts with disobedience. It starts with works. I will get to God and bring God's you know, descendants my own way. I don't trust them. I'm getting too old. Chapter 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. Chapter 17 says, I am almighty God. Walk before me. Be blameless. I'll make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, Behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Abraham means father of multitude. Well, Abram just means father. 
Verse 5, he says, I've made you the father of many nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to God, to you and to your descendants after you. I'm going to keep my promise to you. I'm going to do everything I said I would do. Well, down in verse 15 of the same chapter, there's a problem in Abraham's eyes. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I'll bless her and also give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God, I don't see this as possible. He still got the same problem. That lack of faith that God could just do anything. That God could save you without you having to do a thing. Couldn't accept it. They wanted to get in the midst of it. They wanted to be part of it. He says, look it, why don't we just, I, I got, you know, Ishmael already. Why don't we just go through him? Verse 19, God said, no, Sarah shall bring you a son. I will call his name Isaac. I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. No, it's not Ishmael. This is God's decision. It's going to be Isaac, the name meaning laughter. He is the one that I'm going to use and he's going to come through. Just trust me. Go with me. Verse 22 says, then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. Look at verse 21. My covenant I will establish with Isaac. Isaac is the covenant. As long as we know that and trust that, we can see Jesus through Isaac. So now let's turn to chapter 21 of Genesis and see how this all kind of pans out. Because it helps us understand Galatians even more. So chapter 21, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time that God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of a son who was born to him, Isaac. And so Isaac is born. God keeps his promise because he's always going to keep his promise. And they should have trusted him in the first place. But, you know, we as human beings have a difficult time. Well, in verse 9 of that chapter, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. He was kind of laughing, scoffing at this new son. <laughs> Therefore, she says to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. I want him out of here. Get rid of him, Abraham. I don't want him or Hagar anywhere near this place. Well, that might disappoint you and anger you at, at Sarah. And, and Abraham wasn't, wasn't happy with this. Um, verse 11, the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of the son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of the bondwoman. What Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. There's complete confusion now, a little chaos. These two nations are now going to be separate, one scoffing the other one already. It's going to cause great turmoil. Look at verse 17. They are cast out and, and Hagar is, is beside herself. She's afraid her son's going to die. And verse 17 says, God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. God opened her eyes and 
She saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness. He became as an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And from that point on, the Arab nations were born right there in Egypt. And we know that the issues and problems that have caused throughout history between the Middle East, the Egyptians and the Pharaohs, all the way down to where we are today, it caused tremendous turmoil. Let's go back to Galatians 4, and, and, and he mentions that. He talks about it. The first thing we see is verse 27, the blessings and, and that come from Sarah. For it is written, verse 27, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. So Paul using these two mothers to compare works of the flesh with the miracles of God uses Sarah as an example of Isaiah 54, 1. In, in verse 27 is a direct quote from Isaiah 54, 1. Well, Isaiah 53 is the great chapter of the prophecy of Christ. The last verse in Isaiah 53 talks about this Messiah that would come and bear the sins of many. And so because of Jesus' coming, he begins chapter 54 with rejoice, O barren. See, what is he saying? Here was barren Sarah. Impossible for her to have a child. But she should be rejoicing because God made a promise to her. A promise that the descendants, the Messiah would come through her son. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. She didn't rejoice. She didn't shout. She decided to take methods into her own hands and, 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 and give Hagar. And, and all it did was create turmoil. Look at verse 28. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Just as Isaac was a child of promise, rejoice, barren, because you've been promised something. It doesn't matter what you have on this earth. It's, it's not what you have. It's what you're going to get. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. See, those born of the spirit, those of the lineage of Isaac were continually persecuted by those descendants of Ishmael. You see, it created this turmoil. It set in order a history of these Arab nations. In fact, in, in 571, Muhammad was born, and Muhammad became the symbol of the Islamic nation, their prophet. Well, he's in a direct line to Ishmael. But salvation comes through the lineage of Isaac and the lineage of Sarah, the free woman, not the slave. You see, Hagar was her slave. And, and this birth was, was not out of, of, of God's will. It was, it was op opposed to God's will. And this free woman is where our freedom lies. Hagar represents works of man. And these works of man are continually, if you look at the Arab nations, their religion is completely based on works. And a work that excludes Jesus Christ, so, so they have nothing. Paul writes in Romans 9, verse 6, It is not the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Again, he quotes Isaac and Sarah. Romans 9, 8. That is, those who are of the children of the flesh, 
They are not the children of God. Isaac is the children of promise, child of promise. Ishmael was of the flesh. It wasn't anything God wanted. It was something they did on their own. Verse 8, that is those who are of the children of the flesh, they are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come to Sarah, and she will have a son. So we are the barren ones. Why? Because we can't do anything to be born again, except to be born again. There's, there's not a process. There's two births. In this born again, uh, uh, Spurgeon says, Isaiah calls the church barren because her children are born without effort by word of faith through the spirit of God. It's a matter of birth, not exertion. The believer, too, works, but not in an effort to become a son and an heir of God. You see, we are, are, are not born of a flesh. The Bible says when you're born again, it's, it's kind of like the wind. You don't see it happening. We're not born of effort. We're born of God. It's different. It's completely different. And yet here we are in turmoil. John 16, 2. They will put you out of the synagogues, Jesus told his apostles. <clears throat> the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he's offered God's a service. And these things they will do to you because they've not known the Father or by me. Just because they're born of the bloodline of Abraham doesn't make them part of the body. They must be born again through the Spirit by trusting in Christ. Philippians 3.18, many walk of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, there, there's been a lot of controversy and, and debates in, in my time as a pastor or a Christian. And most of the time it comes from, from believers who just are angry that I would teach that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Why do I teach you not to baptize to be saved? Because it's a work. And the Bible clearly says it's not by works. Am I baptized? Absolutely. Why? Because I'm following in obedience to God, not because I need to do it to be saved. I follow obedience to God because I desire to please my Lord. So the law becomes my road, not my rod, do you see? So then in verse 30, <clears throat> he says, nevertheless, what does scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So he takes the very words that Sarah said to Abraham concerning Ishmael. Cast them out. Get rid of them. And he uses that as a picture, a symbolic movement of casting out works of the law for salvation. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And if you follow the works of the law, that's Mount Sinai. That is death because the wages of sin is death and the law brings nothing but sin so cast out the bible says in second corinthians 10 5 casting down every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god we got to do some casting out we cast out those philosophies that we hold that are opposite to scripture we got to get rid of them John 12, 31 says, this is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. There'll come a time when Satan is cast out. Finally, John 15, 6, if anyone does not abide in me, Jesus says, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather and throw them into a fire and they are burned to be cast out. Verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. But if you don't abide in Christ, you're cast into this fire. Matthew 8, 10. Jesus marvels at the centurion's faith when he uh, tells Jesus just to say the word and my servant will be healed. And he responds to that saying, boy, this I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. 
In Matthew 8, 11, Jesus says, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, meaning non-Jews will come and sit. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in the art of darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, you don't understand how this works, Jesus says. There are some that are in this lineage of the kingdom of David that aren't going to be sitting with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then there are going to be those from outside the Israelites, Gentiles like you and I, who will be sitting. Oh man, there's going to come a day we're going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and talk with them, walk with them. But not everybody will. Some will be cast out. We got to cast out those teachings that, that prompt the casting out of the lost. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works and the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. The death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. See, I don't want to be judged according to my works. I want to be judged according to the works of Christ in my life. Revelation 20, 14, then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, that's not us. John 6, 37 says, all the father gives me will come to me. And anyone who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. See, there's a symbolic picture of the casting out of Hagar the casting out of Ishmael, the casting out of the offering that came from Cain. There's the principle of twos. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And man decided again to do their own work. When they ate that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says Adam's sin was passed on to every person. Very shortly after that, there were two offerings, one from Cain, one from Abel. One accepted, one not. There were two offerings. Then there are two sons of Abraham, one by the work of man. You see the common? Every wrong choice is a work. Every wrong choice is man trying to get there on its own, on his own. And these two sons brought two covenants. These Covenants of the works of the law, and then the better covenant, the work of Christ. There are two fathers. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees in John 6, 44, and he says, you are of your father, the devil. There are two births, and there are two deaths. There is physical birth. And then John 3 tells us we must be born again, born of the spirit. And there are two deaths, the physical death of our body and the spiritual death of being separated from God. That's what the Bible calls the second death. The beauty of it is you, if you're born twice, you only have to die once. But if you're born once, then you have two deaths awaiting you. The principle of twos, two gates, a narrow one that leads to righteousness and the broad one that leads to destructions. Two mountains, Mount Sinai, where Hagar represents the terror and anger of God because of the sin of mankind, or Mount Zion in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, in which all the saints of God are gathered to, to no more come under sin, no more come under death, no more see darkness, no more see pain, but sit with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. There are two ways, 
John 3, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's only one right way. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes in the Father except through me. It's a principle of twos. And in every right choice, it is surrendering our will, surrendering our work, surrendering our idea of what religion is to the truth of scripture, to Jesus Christ. He's the way. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son has not life. Do you have the son today? I trust that you do. I trust that, that you have, have placed yourself under the protected arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he is the way you're trusting in for your eternity. Next week, we'll follow up this lesson by following not the cast out line of Ishmael, but following the beautiful treasured line to Christ through the Old Testament. And, and we'll, we'll bring ourselves next week from Isaac right up to the precipice of the birth of Christ. And the 25th, uh, we will celebrate that birth. And we will study that birth and rejoice in that miraculous birth. Now, Mary wasn't a barren woman, but it certainly was a woman with no seed dropped in her. Born of a virgin, a miraculous birth, not by the will of man, but only by the will of God. Rejoice, you who are not in labor. Wow, what a blessedness. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to make the decisions to surrender to the scriptural way of salvation. To not intervene our own works, ideas, and philosophies but to cast them out and trust fully in the work of Christ. We thank you for your death on the cross for us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you, Lord, that we are no longer condemned. And we thank you, Lord, uh, for everything. For without you, we can do nothing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. A lot happening in the future weeks. I hope you will join us for as much as you can. Have a great week.